Well, thank you so much, uh, Robin, for that introduction. Uh, we are indeed uh, ready to get started. Uh, uh, I wish uh, uh, we were up in Seattle today, which is where we were supposed to, to, to be. If you look at this first slide, you'll see a beautiful day, which uh, Dr. Benzinger has told us is in fact the case. Uh, so we're really missing being up there in Seattle, uh, Bill. Uh, and so hopefully next time we will be able to be there in person. I hope so. Yes. So uh, first of all, uh, I just want to uh, thank our sponsors. We uh, have been most fortunate that our sponsors are uh, very supportive of our uh, need to shift to this virtual platform and have the components of a seminar in this compact format. What we are including today for the first time is uh, the option for interactive questions. And so as we go through, there are a few interactive questions uh, which we'll explain as we get to them. Uh, they are ones where you can just answer yes or no. And uh, it's going to be interesting just to see, number one, how that works, and number two, what the answers to the questions are. And so, uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce our uh, panel today. Uh, very, very pleased to have uh, with us uh, Dr. Joseph McHale. Uh, Joe, who is uh, the Chief Medical Officer for the International Myeloma Foundation, and he's offer also Professor at TGen, a genomics uh, uh, group uh, and research entity in, in Phoenix, uh, where he also has a clinical practice. And so, uh, welcome to Joe. Thanks, Brian. Always good to be with you, my friend. So thank you. Uh, and very pleased to welcome uh, uh, Dr. William uh, Bill, Bill Benzinger, who, whom we have known for so many years, uh, decades actually. And uh, uh, Bill has uh, worked in Seattle for, for several decades and is currently at uh, Swede Swedish Cancer Institute and uh, is obviously a very well-renowned uh, myeloma expert and particularly an expert on autologous and allogeneic transplant. And so fortunate to have Bill with us today because there are a lot of questions about that during this COVID-19 crisis. So welcome, Bill. Thank you, Brian. Happy to be here as always. And so, uh, last but not least, uh, very, very pleased to have uh, Joseph Taraman with us, who, as you'll notice, is, is both a nurse and a PhD, and so really a tremendous uh, uh, individual who's focused on myeloma uh, for close to 20 years. Um, he's currently an assistant professor at DePaul in Chicago, and as we were chatting, uh, he's hopeful that he will soon be an associate professor. So we have our fingers crossed for that, uh, Joseph. So so welcome today. Thanks for having me, Brian, and uh, thanks for that very, very kind comment. So. Oh, well, we're very pleased to have you with us. So, so let's get started. Uh, I'm moving forward to what is uh, slide number three, uh, and that is, uh, just to introduce what you heard from Robin, is that we have session one, which is about uh, COVID-19 guidelines, and then the second session, which will be about details of ongoing myeloma care. And so if we start session one, uh, going to slide number five, I think there is one single message which we have all heard a lot in these last couple of months or so, that to try to uh, flatten the curve to try to reduce the spread of the COVID-19 and also to stay personally safe, staying home is really a key thing for patients with myeloma and to uh, use the precautions of hand washing and what I call physical distancing. I think that the distancing is one where we want you to stay physically apart from individuals who might be a source of infection, but we uh, recognize that, uh, as with seminars like this, uh, it's important to stay socially connected and to have uh, a strong social network to try to get through this whole crisis situation together. So just some bullet points about the coronavirus itself. Uh, on slide number six, uh, it's obviously highly infectious, even more infectious than we had at first realized. It's spread by droplets, which can be uh, from coughing and sneezing, both in the air 
and from surfaces where uh, the droplets can linger from uh, hours to even a few days. And so uh, being very careful uh, about cleaning surfaces uh, when you're out and about is ex incredibly important. Uh, the biggest risk, without a doubt, is close person-to-person -person transfer for someone who is infected, even if they may not be symptomatic at the time and even if they may not even realize that they are infected. We've started to understand some additional features about the disease. Uh, uh, one strange thing is that if the infection is predominantly in the nose area, uh, there can be a loss of smell. Uh, there also can be a variety of other symptoms, including GI symptoms, and, and uh, rarely you've seen uh, on the news some strange skin problems which have been occurring uh, more so in uh, children. And so the first poll polling question, uh, which uh, I think we'll all be interested to, to know the answer to, is uh, are you, uh, as myeloma patients, still sticking with the stay-at-home guidelines, despite all these uh, reopenings that are happening across the United States. So this will be coming to you now, and so if you could answer yes or no, we'll be interested to, to see uh, if you are indeed sticking with the, the stay-at-home uh, process. All right. Okay, so uh, the answer is in. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. Can they see it on the screen? Okay, uh, you can see it. Yes, 96%. Uh, so uh, uh, personally, I think that that is fantastic because that is the most secure way to stay safe. 4% uh, uh, no. Uh, and so uh, there may be situations where you do need to get out and about and uh, with due uh, caution. So uh, with this first introduction, uh, I'll be interested in uh, feedback from our panel. Uh, and so, uh, for example, Joe, uh, how do you feel about the, the, the stay at home and how do you see that uh, transitioning as we, as we move forward? Yeah, thanks, Brian. I mean, I think, um, as we've often said, nobody knows the future. So we always have to be careful how uh, concrete people feel about some of these things. But, you know, the, I'm very glad to see that 96% as well, because uh, there is no doubt whether we look at the example of New Zealand or other places, we can really contain this. And I think it's very important that people continue to do that. Of course, the, the looking forward, we can't stay this way forever. So I think it's very important for people to know what was going on in their local area, what are the recommendations from the health experts in their area. It would be different, of course, if someone's in New York or if someone is in northern Idaho. Uh, you know, we have such a, a variance within. Uh, but I think as we go through now, we're going to see some of the exact precautions that we can encourage people to do uh, yes, indeed, stay at home is sort of the number one anchor, but there are multiple other things people can do as they do uh, have to go out for their groceries, as they do start to re-engage in life. Uh, there are many other steps that we can take, and I know we're going to take time to go through those. So I do think we have to start opening up at some point, but I'm very glad to hear that people are still adhering uh, until we truly see these numbers drop off that they're staying at home. Yeah, so thank you, Joe. So, uh, Bill, uh, the Seattle, Washington area has been uh, uh, strongly affected by this uh, crisis. Uh, how do you see things moving forward there? I would assume that stay at home is still the, the number one mantra, but uh, patients do need to come into the clinic and get back to some degree of uh, normality. How do you see it moving forward? Well, we've, we've been in a lockdown pretty much uh, for the past uh six to eight weeks, but it is starting to open up now with limited uh, um, activities and parks and trails. Uh, and there, there is a phase two where they're actually going to open up uh, certain uh, business activities that are able to uh, have curbside delivery and pickup. But the whole underlying theme of this is social distancing. Because until yes. we have a vaccine or an effective uh, 
antiviral that can control this, uh, the infection when you get it, uh, the best way is to avoid getting it in the first place. And that's where social yes. distancing comes in. But we are, we have, our governor who's taken a lead in this has outlined a four phase uh, process where things will open up every three weeks. As long as there isn't a rise in the numbers of cases uh, that occur. So each of the steps that have come along, if it doesn't, uh, if it isn't associated with greater numbers of transmission of disease, uh, we are going to slowly open this up. But it'll be the end of July before we're back to nearly full activities. And certain things are are way off in the future, such as uh, attending stadiums events, sports events, concerts, and really even things like movie theaters, they're off in the future. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, we're going to have to move forward, but but just quickly, Joseph, uh, what is the story in the Chicago area right now? Um, we are just a little bit behind of other um, states, but uh, we are experiencing a high number of cases overall in Cook County in Chicago. And so um, the mayor and the governor of Illinois have been really, really um, working hard to monitor the data, and um, they are very cautious in, in giving dates. So, so far right now, what we have is still stay at home until uh, June 1st, and uh, there's no further guidance after that. So we're, right. we keep on waiting. Waiting to see, absolutely, absolutely. So, so let's go forward right now. Uh, uh, next, I'm just going to give a little bit of a background of the timeline, which actually is helpful in looking at what might be the timeline uh, moving forward. And so on slide number nine, I've just uh, put in the middle uh, China, which is where this uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, first began in uh, uh, Wuhan. And uh, the more that we learn about this, it seems that uh, the original infection probably started certainly in December, maybe even tracking back a little bit into November. Uh, and so the live market in Wuhan, which we think was the source of the COVID-19 virus, was closed on January the 1st, uh, which tells you that, you know, Back in December, uh, the Chinese were definitely worried, uh, and on January the 8th was when uh, the first case of community uh, spread was reported from Wuhan, uh, at least publicly. Uh, one, one suspects that probably there was a, a realization of community spread that extended uh, prior to that. But, but the important dates for us are the, the dates that uh, the, the virus spread uh, to, to Europe and to the U.S. And so early on, uh, there was a transmission uh, from Wuhan to Seattle. And then, although we don't know exactly the date, there was also uh, transmission to the San Francisco area uh, in that mid-January time frame. And over to the right, uh, you can see where that gave rise to very high areas of infection, both in Washington State and down in parts of uh, California. Uh, what is interesting and important is in Germany, it seems that the first infection uh, arrived in uh, Munich, uh, again in that mid-January time frame, uh, and then uh, the virus uh, was picked up in uh, close to Milan, Italy, shortly after that, also in, in mid-January. Uh, one key point about that is that it did seem that uh, there has been some uh, mutation in the virus and possibly even a new strain of virus that emerged, which may have accounted for the very uh, serious uh, infection rate that occurred in Italy. And also, uh, the the fact that the uh, COVID-19 crisis in New York uh, seems to have predominantly uh, come from Italy rather than coming. There obviously has been some transfer across uh, all of the states from the West Coast, but mostly on the East Coast, uh, it arrived uh, from Europe and mostly from uh, Italy, also a little bit from uh, Austria. So it's extremely important 
as we try to think about opening up and returning to normal activity is within our local population moving forward, uh, as we uh, dampen down the active infections and we have the possibility of uh, new infections popping up, uh, where are those infections coming from? Well, uh, obviously, a travel hotspot would be the key thing. And so right now, uh, there is uh, very limited travel. Uh, another source is uh, super spreaders. Uh, what has been noticed is that among uh, individuals who are infected, some have a very, very high virus load related to the virus reproducing much faster and to a much higher level. And even one such individual in a large group setting can contribute to a lot of infection in the population. And the same thing seems to be true within high-risk groups, and I've given you a list of them there. Uh, but uh, And we've, we've heard so many of those in the news in the last uh, couple of months, the, the, the situations uh, of high density in New York, the ships where there has been infection, even truck drivers uh, transferring the, the infection across the country. But within our own local population, as we emphasized already, the key thing is that physical distancing is the way to reduce the uh, increase in uh, occurrence of the infection, which is currently running at around 2 to 5% mostly. But in New York, for example, uh, has gone up to 15 to 20 percent. It's important also to be aware that the risk factors for uh, infection uh, influence the, the, the likelihood of severe problems. And this map of, a, of the U.S. on slide number 11, the red areas show the areas where there's likely to be the most trouble. And that is where there are individuals with the highest number of risk factors, such as high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, obesity, uh, and chronic lung and kidney problems and the like, and also uh, high-risk situations, uh, for example, in nursing homes. And across the U.S., nursing home residents have contributed incredibly. A, a, a very, very high number of cases have actually come from nursing home uh, residents. And you can see the pattern in the south and in the east and uh, with mostly a much better picture in the middle of the U.S. and on the West Coast. It's helpful to compare the U.S. with other places. And I think for me as a practicing physician in the U.S., it's actually very sad to see that a lot of other countries have uh, done a lot better than the U.S. Uh, some of the places where there has been a lot of trouble have been Spain and Italy uh, uh, and also the UK, uh, and this uh, is related to uh, when you comb through the haystacks. If you look at slide number uh, uh, 12, if you look on the right, uh, at the top of the list are the places where a lot of COVID-19 testing has been performed. And when you do more testing, you know how much infection that you have and where is the infection so that you can do tracing and containment and try to limit the spread of the infection. And if you look at the bottom of that list, you'll see the United States is pretty close to the bottom. We have Ecuador below us, um, but most other countries are above us in, in terms of being able to uh, have conducted tests to know where we have infection. And so this makes it really quite difficult in the U.S. to reopen without knowing exactly what we're dealing with. So we need to pay close attention on slide number 13 to the, the major medical factors that can in, influence the likelihood of problems. Age is a factor, although we've seen that young people can also have serious problems, but percentage-wise, over the age of 65 and certainly over the age of 75, is a substantial risk factor. High blood pressure, cardiac issues, obesity, and diabetes, collectively in the U.S., those have uh, turned out to be the major sources of uh, predisposing factors occurring in New York, for example. And those do link to uh, the ACE2 receptor. On the surface of cells, there's something called the ACE2 receptor, 
and it can be modified in such a way that uh, it's more attractive to the COVID-19, which uh, hangs on to this receptor and can get into the cells and can reproduce. And when you have hypertension, cardiac issues, obesity, and diabetes, uh, the receptor is modified such that this is more likely to happen, and this is what really predisposes these people to have more problems. So you'll see halfway down the list, we have cancer diagnosis, which is obviously myeloma, and so it's been a bit unexpected and surprising that having a cancer diagnosis is obviously a risk factor, but it's not the top of the list. Uh, and then below that, you have some of the other things which are key important factors, including uh, social disparities, uh, race. Obviously, we've heard a lot now about uh, African Americans, Hispanics, and even American Indians. The Navajo have really been uh, devastated by uh, the COVID-19. And so the, the issues that have emerged have been many, and uh, we have seen that, that COVID-19 really dominates the news that we all listen to each day, and one of them has related to the loss of jobs and the loss of uh, so many resources where food security has become a concern, uh, both for those who are able to get it, where they need to decide whether to go to the grocery store or uh, get home delivery, but the precautions that are necessary to avoid getting exposed during that uh, uh, getting the food process. But this is particularly a problem for the disadvantaged. And so I do have some good news uh, just released is a, a COVID-19 emergency food assistance program that has been list, just been launched. And this is really wonderful. Uh, and Bristol Myers uh, Squibb, uh, previously uh, the, the cell gene, um, the, uh, they are uh, important sponsors of this uh, program, which is really wonderful to see. And I can perhaps just mention that it has been amazing to see how all of our pharmaceutical partners have been so focused on trying to contribute all different kinds of ways that they can help. And I, I can say that I do see moving forward that we will need their help and input to, to get through all these different issues that have been emerging. And so now we have a, another question. Uh, most of you have been staying at home. However, the question coming up is, uh, if you're a myeloma patient, have you tested positive for uh, COVID-19? And so we're hoping that the answer to this uh, will be no, but it would be nice to have that confirmed. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right, this is wonderful. We only have uh, uh, 1%, so we, we have uh, over 1,000 people on this call, I believe, so that, that means that uh, there may be uh, perhaps ten, most 10 people uh, who, who have been uh, COVID positive, and so perhaps we'll hear any uh, concerns that have emerged from that. So 1%, that is uh, phenomenal, excellent, excellent news. Okay, so uh, we have time for uh, questions and comments here. Hello. Yeah. So, so uh, Bill, I thought I would turn to you first uh, uh, and, and ask you uh, what you think about the, um, the the various risk factors for uh, problems with COVID uh, uh, nineteen. Uh, uh, you, you, you've had just a couple of patients that were affected, but um, uh, my impression is I'm not so sure if it's so much about the myeloma, but maybe some of the other cofactors that might predispose them to have problems. Yeah, that's a, a very good point. Um, so, as you know, and every, all of us know, um, myeloma is a disease of older patients with a median age of about 70 years. So... Age alone is a risk factor if uh, you develop COVID, and older patients uh, tend to have uh, more adverse outcomes. But in addition, older patients have comorbidities. 
cardiac disease, lung disease, hypertension, diabetes, all things that Brian has mentioned. But layer on top of that, uh, myeloma, which is a cancer of an immune cell, plasma cells, and such as such patients who have myeloma can have altered immunity and suppressed immunity. Uh, they don't have normal levels of antibodies most of the time, and they don't have uh, normal immune responses to vaccines and other stimuli. Layer on that, in addition, the chemotherapy that's given that also can be immunosuppressive, and you can see that all of these things contribute to an increased risk for complications if you were to develop COVID-19. And so it is important to practice all the measures that Brian has talked about, and the best defense about this is not to get it. Absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, so, so, Joseph, I'm wondering in Chicago, I, I touched on the issue about uh, f food security and f food uh, uh, sourcing. Uh, do you have any comments about about that aspect, uh, uh, either the scarcity uh, for some people or um, the protections that are needed for uh, myeloma patients to try to stay safe? Um. For the city of Chicago, we definitely have a problem with um, with food supply. Our uh, pantry and our non for profit organizations here have been um, calling for support and um, funding because they are definitely having an increased demand from uh, citizens of Chicago, not just the cancer patient population, but it is definitely a worrisome uh, situation when a patient with cancer also has to deal with uh, food insecurity. We have um, definitely in our practice, we have our social worker and also our um, nurses are asking questions if there are anything that the patient is experiencing. It's very important that um, we ask the patients what's going on at home, how are they coping with, um, with the uh, pandemic and uh, who are their support system and making sure that uh, there are no gaps that could potentially put the patient at risk or being isolated or that that's not necessarily Absolutely. A part of it so all right well thank you for that so uh i think just to keep things forward i think we need to uh talk quite a bit about some of the details that do relate to um uh, the treatment for myeloma patients some of the things that have been necessary in the short term, but our goal of trying to get back to as much of a, a normal uh, treatment uh, planning uh, as possible. So if we uh, look at the next slide, number 18, the, the main way in which uh, a myeloma patient might be at risk is if uh, they uh, need to go in uh, to the clinic for, for urgent care, although um, uh, actually uh, a number of the myeloma patients uh, that I'm aware of that are COVID uh, positive have actually um, become COVID positive, positive because of contacts actually out in the community. But the big concern obviously has been to go in to the hospital where there has been such a focus on uh, uh, patients who are desperately ill uh, with COVID-19. But uh, some patients with active myeloma at a new diagnosis or relapse absolutely uh, have to go in and get uh, care uh, in the safest way possible. A big, big question, which uh, I'm sure we'll uh, touch on in just a second, has been should a patient uh, go ahead and get uh, an autologous stem cell transplant, ASCT? And uh, the answer has been mostly no in the short term, but I'll leave it to Bill to maybe comment on some of the nuances of that. Uh, at the present time, uh, cellular therapies such as the CAR-T programs have been uh, not accruing, uh, but again, this is such a decisive therapy that moving forward, we want to see uh, strong ways that cellular therapies can be utilized again. Uh, for some myeloma patients, having low blood counts is a, is a concern, and so uh, dose reductions have been recommended for those patients just to be on the cautious side. 
Also, high-dose steroids can be a risk, although they can also help uh, with inflammation, which comes from virus infection. And a small point is that uh, low vitamin D levels uh, are not good, and so uh, maintaining good vitamin D is a good idea. But what's been happening and what may continue to happen and what myeloma patients need to be increasingly aware of is that uh, most uh, uh, centers, myeloma-specific uh, centers for sure, have been switching over to telemedicine, where they have been using uh, video chat or at least telephone calls or emails to communicate with the patients and organize planning so that the patient does not need to come into the clinic. There are also different ways to get the lab testing done so it can be done safely, or maybe uh, skip the blood counts for uh, a week or two uh, if the blood counts have been steady. Uh, also cut back on the frequency of the bisphosphonates, the zomeda or the iridia for the time being. Uh, and as I said, maybe some dose reductions to make sure there's not neutropenia. And also uh, perhaps use an oral agent, uh, a proteasome inhibitor like Ninlaro versus Valcade or Kyprolis, although uh, for a patient with active disease, it may be that every effort is necessary to try to get that IV infusion. Uh, but, uh, for for example, uh, Darzalex, uh, there's a balance. Uh, does the patient come in uh, to get those follow-up Darzalex infusions or, or perhaps delay for now? And as we'll mention a little bit later, it's great news that uh, Darzalex is now available as a sub-Q shot. So that is great. And also for quite a number of patients who are on clinical trials, it's helpful to know that some of the visits and, and dose aging and things can be modified and still stay on the protocol. And so we are interested to know uh, how many of you have in fact been getting your care using something like telemedicine where you have a video chat or a telephone call or communicate by email, et cetera, without going into the clinic. And so if you can let us know yes or no on that, we'll be most interested. We do understand that in some parts of the country, uh, the doctor's uh, offices are not really set up for this. And uh, we have had comments from a number of patients where they say they want to do it, but the doctor has not been set up to do it. Uh, but now there are uh, billing uh, mechanisms in place to, to, to be able to get it done. And even um, some of the uh, HIPAA regulations have been relaxed uh, to, to allow this to occur. Okay, so this is interesting. 64% have in fact been doing that, 36% no. And so uh, uh, we'll see, we'll maybe get some questions. For the ones that are answering no, uh, whether that's because it's maybe just not been available to them. And so uh, uh, let's go to uh, another uh, Q&A uh, session. And so uh, Joe, perhaps uh, you could comment on this aspect of the of the telemedicine uh, for now and how you view that moving forward. Yeah, absolutely, Brian. And, you know, I'm seeing now about at least three quarters of my patients by video, uh, and and that leaves those that really have to come in to come into a safer clinic, as it were, where we're, it's more easily to social distance and the like. I I would like to add that. You know, it was very appropriate that we listed all those risk factors, but it. I also want to balance that by saying, you know, we have not seen, and this is now a national phenomenon, we have not seen as many cases as we would have expected in heme malignancies in general. And, and I think part of that is because the risk may not be as high, and, and of course, you're the expert in the world myeloma experience, but also I think part of it is on this same vein of telemedicine, you know, our hematological malignancy patients have been taught to wash their hands carefully, to disinfect, to physically distance when necessary, to wear a mask when appropriate. So all those on the line today that when you've been through a bone marrow transplant, all those things we taught you after a transplant actually are really coming in handy now. So I think that's part of it. And as I say, thirdly, right. I, think, I think the risk is lower. I think they've been taking the correct measures, and I think our clinics are safer because we've been very careful. I was discussing this very closely with a number of myeloma clinics in the New York City area, and they also would have expected to have more cases than they have. And I think part of that has been because of this. And, and the balance, of course, is that um, I think one of the risk factors, of course, is, is having very active myeloma. If you have 
real disease, as, as many of our patients do, we don't want to undertreat that for the risk of COVID. So every patient has to be looked at individually, discuss this with their physician. I have been concerned, having lived through the SARS epidemic that we had in Canada many years ago, that a lot of patients may not be reporting their symptoms and may not be followed up and may not be getting their treatment. And we find, unfortunately, later when we emerge from the epidemic that people are in, or in this case, pandemic, people are in, in worse situations. So it's one thing if we put things on hold for a week or two or a month or even two months, but knowing how this is moving and how this is going to take a longer time, I really encourage people to discuss this exact point with their their treating physician. Sometimes it makes sense to go to oral therapy or to reduce the frequency, but very often you need your treatment because active myeloma is a risk factor. Controlled myeloma will help reduce that risk factor. Yeah. Yeah, very, very important. And, and just to comment on one point that you raised, Joe, uh, it's true that uh, through the uh, International Myeloma Foundation, we're in touch with groups all around the world, and it has been impressive, for example, hearing from Asia. So we have contacts, uh, clinical trials group, actually, with seven countries in Asia, the Asia Myeloma Network. And within that group, there have been, uh, actually, within the, the groups themselves, there have been no positive cases with COVID-19. And this emphasizes the point that, particularly in Asia, there is a tradition of wearing masks if there's a concern about infection, a very careful uh, hand washing. Those kinds of things have definitely protected our myeloma patients. Uh, but in addition, it just does not seem that um, uh, myeloma patients themselves and, and those that are on active treatment do not seem to fall exactly into a higher risk group. And it may be that um, the treatment itself uh, shuts down some of the inflammatory or other processes that can be a danger uh, with the COVID-19 infection. Uh, so, so uh, Bill, uh, what thoughts do you have about the, the telemedicine? Has your practice shifted over to that, and how do you view that moving, moving forward? Yeah, I'm seeing about uh, half of my patients now uh, with telemedicine visits because uh, in many cases, the uh, checkups involve really checking their lab assessment, talking to the patient, and uh, uh, asking them you know, how they're feeling and this doesn't necessarily require an in-person visit. And as uh, Joe points out, this uh, protects the patient, but it also protects patients who have to come in because there's fewer patients in the clinic. Um, right. I actually think that the reduced uh, incidence of COVID in our uh, patient population is precisely due to the measures you've outlined uh, the hand washing, mask wearing, social distancing, these are things that most of our uh, myeloma patients take for granted. And I think this has protected them through uh, this pandemic. Absolutely, yeah, very, very important point. So I agree fully. Uh, okay, so let's move forward and, and get to the, um, uh, the latter parts of this discussion about the COVID-19. A, a few uh, different things that we need to think about um, moving forward. And so if we go to slide number 23, what do we need to know now? Uh, and so as I've mentioned already, uh, as things open up, it makes a big difference how many individuals have been exposed uh, in the area where you live, uh, which could be uh, much less in Arizona versus uh, New York versus Washington or some parts of California. And then you need to be uh, uh, checking to be aware of um, if there is infection, where is that coming from? Is it coming from the, the nursing homes and you need to be cautious about contacts or which other settings uh, like a, a meat packing plant or some other uh, place where there have been pockets of infection? And then we need to be uh, much, much more aware of uh, the people who are truly at risk, the, the, uh, the, the people who have comorbid conditions, the high blood pressure and the like, and, and particularly some of the racial factors, African-Americans, Hispanics, American Indians, uh, and, and others. Uh, now, one point just to emphasize, this has been very much in the news. What is the role of antibody tests? And so on slide number 24, what I give for our patients are a number of links which discuss uh, antibody testing. 
And so the simple answer about antibody testing is that it does indicate if someone has been exposed to the COVID-19, but it does not tell you if you're necessarily immune. Uh, and the problem recently has been that the tests are not that reliable yet, although the FDA has just approved a new test from Roach, which they say is 99% accurate, but we'll, we'll see about that. I think it's going to take some time and we probably will need some, some newer antibody tests. But, but the issue is that uh, even if you have a positive antibody test, does that mean that you can just go straight out into the community and that you're protected? Uh, we just don't know that yet. And so uh, to discuss this, I would suggest uh, those who are most interested might want to look at a user's guide to the immune system. Should you get an antibody test? One of the links that I gave you there, which I think uh, goes into a lot of the different details that might answer questions that you might have. One big thing when we are stuck at home in quarantine is it is absolutely crucial <laughs> to try to get out and about a little bit. And so it is definitely safe uh, to go out for a walk, respect physical distancing, but try to make <laughs> social connections in an appropriate way, or, a way, way, wear a mask, and increasingly, and I'll be interested to hear from my colleagues, uh, proper masks, medical type masks, are becoming more available, but if not, you can wear a cloth mask. And uh, some exercise is really a good idea from all kinds of uh, perspectives. And getting together, and this is a picture of the go-to virtual support groups. Uh, we do have a whole uh, group of uh, support groups across the United States, and many of you, I'm sure, are members of those. And we have had uh, the great honor and pleasure to, to lead some meetings with these uh, support groups. And in fact, over 75 support groups across the U.S. now we are helping uh, with the virtual Go to meetings program to help people get together, to stay socially connected, to learn from each other, and have uh, best ideas about how to move forward together. And so, uh, I don't know if there are any uh, particular points that anyone would like to pick up on from from those aspects. I, I think that trying to maintain the social connections for our patients is, is particularly important. Uh, so Joseph, uh, what are you th your thoughts on that? No thoughts. <laughs> is the audio gone? Are we all right? Okay. All right, I'm, I'm back. So, um, so sorry. Practice we have, um, you know, Relax our policy. We are now um, we respond to emails to our patients, and we also try to um, check on other patients whom we know are living alone. And also, we encourage our patients to talk to other patients and also do um, uh, FaceTime and also uh, be active, be socially active in this time of uh, social distancing. Right. Right. Okay. I couldn't so agree more, Brian. I mean, I find it almost paradoxical that we're all in one way segregated, but in another way, I've never felt more unified in a myeloma community than right now. You know, the things that the IMF are doing and so many others to try and bring patients together, the support group picture that you showed, you know, I think we're all tired of Zoom and virtual meetings. On the other hand, it's allowed us a connection. You know, I, I think one of the long-term Sadly to say benefits, you I mean there's always a, some kind of silver lining. This has been absolutely horrific. And my heart goes to those that have suffered with this and have died of this. I think of colleagues of mine that have passed away on the front lines. And yet, I think going forward, it's teaching us of that critical importance of connection to each other. And even, as you mentioned earlier, the video uh, consults and the video connections we have with our patients uh, in some ways, it, it, although I much rather be in front of them, it, it has been wonderful to see them with their pets in the background or their or their you know in their in their own family rooms. In many respect, I I almost feel like I'm being invited into my patient's home when I meet with yeah. them on a video basis. And these might sound like small emotional things, but we need to be connected through this. This is such an isolating time. 
It's so important for us to find our way of connection. Some people prefer it over the phone. Some prefer it over video or FaceTime or social media, whatever it is. But um, we absolutely need this. And I, I really commend those right. who have worked so hard to do that. And I hope in the long run, We'll be able to, we obviously still have to see patients physically in the clinic and have meetings as the IMF convenes them and so on, but we're learning a, a virtual format that can be an add-on to that face-to-face -face format, and I, I'm really encouraged by that. Yes, yes, and I've actually had very positive feedback for, from a number of patients who are uh, using the virtual meetings. Uh, they have committed time with the doctor, which they love, and which is often not the case. The doctor's not running off down the hall to do something else. They have that committed time, uh, and uh, each the doctor can see the patient, the patient can see the doctor, and uh, the, there is that committed time to have a, a personal and detailed review. So it, it is uh, positive. Uh, we, one question that came in is, uh, in talking about getting IV Zomata, uh, there's nothing wrong with a Zomata. The Zomata is not a negative risk factor. It's just um, the, the risk of coming into the clinic and the possibility of getting the COVID-19 exposure. But uh, th there's no indication that, that Zomata is a problem to take it. And so if you happen to have been in and got your Zomata, that's, that's not a problem. Okay, so let's go forward to the final area where it's also quite encouraging to see what treatments do we have. Uh, as I think uh, uh, Bill mentioned, uh, we, we will need to do social distancing until we have a vaccine and or until we have treatments that work against this darn virus. And so although uh, on slide number 28, uh, I'm indicating remdesivir is, is an active antiviral. It certainly reduced the number of uh, days in, uh, in uh, uh, hospital for some patients from uh, 15 to 14 days. Uh, it's a step forward. And uh, there's just a report actually today uh, from Asia where a combination of three antivirals uh, are, are starting to work against COVID-19. And so I do see a way forward towards a kind of cocktail uh, which we've become familiar with in the treatment of the of the AIDS virus actually and so uh, it's just a matter of how much time will it take to have that. It's pretty interesting that Selenexor just recently approved for the treatment of relapsed myeloma does have antiviral properties and trials are going on or getting started all across the US and in fact globally. The use of the plasma infusions is phenomenal and we've already been seeing a benefit in a few patients where the infusions have really produced uh, uh, dramatic recoveries. Uh, there is a, is a group, uh, a partnership which includes Takeda, where they're looking to develop hyperimmune immunoglobulin, where they would collect up the antibodies uh, in, a, in a more uh, compact fashion as treatment, which is great. Uh, tuberculosis vaccination, this is the type of vaccination that stimulates the uh, macrophages, the, the kind of garbage collectors in the bone marrow, the ones that scoop up the virus and destroy them. Uh, if you can make them more active using BC vaccina vaccination, uh, that may work. In countries where uh, BC vaccination has been routine, it seems that there has been uh, fewer problems. And of course, we're all waiting for the vaccine to come along. Uh, I've been personally most interested in the group in Oxford in the UK, where they're using the RNA approach, the messenger RNA approach, which makes it a lot faster to develop the vaccine. And we'll see uh, there are over 100 efforts to, to have a vaccine. And so one has to hope that one of them is going to pay off and be available in the not too distant future. Just a little bit about what's going on. Uh, uh, myeloma patients have questions about um, the antibodies and, and the immunity because that's what myeloma is all about. And so if we look at slide number 29, when the virus comes in, it is uh, taken up and then the, the, the RNA from the virus the, is used to make a new virus. And so this replication uh, after the uptake, you can see there on the top slide that ACE2 receptor. The ACE2 receptor is where the spike protein of the 
coronavirus, which is that uh, like a golf tee uh, on the on the outside of the of the virus, it attaches to the ACE2 protein. The cell gets in, it makes lots more RNA, and then the RNA makes a whole new virus. And so, if we move forward, that new virus is then uh, presented to the immune system. And so it's presented in two ways. One, where antibodies are produced, and so those same kind of B cells and plasma cells which make myeloma protein, the ones which are uncommitted are exposed and uh, can start making antibodies against the COVID-19. But at the same time, uh, the virus is hopefully getting destroyed by cytotoxic T cells and also by macrophages. And so that's why there are different factors in the immune system that can influence the course of the disease. Uh, it's not just the antibodies, uh, but they, they are terribly important. And so as we move towards uh, the, the, the summary for uh, the uh, COVID-19 crisis right now, what will the new normal look like? Well, on slide number 31, I've chosen to call it the new abnormal because I don't think it's ever going to be quite the same. And this is really sad to see is that things I think may have changed forever in a slightly different direction. Uh, we will need to pay a lot more attention to physical distancing for, for quite some time. This virtual social networking will become uh, very important. Uh, all kinds of testing uh, will become important. I think uh, just how that will evolve remains to be seen. Right now, it's so important to determine where the virus is so that we can be careful uh, to avoid communities where infection rates are high. Masks in public, I think, will become the standard. Uh, regular masks are becoming more available, but certainly a fabric mask uh, can be used. Telemedicine, it will be the new abnormal. It'll become the normal. Uh, and um, for myeloma patients, the treatment paradigm will evolve. But as uh, Joe has emphasized, we want to stick as close as possible to what we would recommend. We don't want to be cutting back with IV treatments that patients really do need. Uh, for traveling, I think that that is going to be severely limited. and. Uh, it's going to be important for all patients to have a good way to get to and from the clinic and to limit other kinds of travel, except to try to get a little bit of vacation for sanity. And so a question that comes up, can I get through this without getting the infection? Well, uh, I think that uh, if you're staying home and taking precautions, every hope is that you can. Uh, the key is to avoid becoming part of a local cluster. And the, and the goal, like in uh, New Zealand, New Zealand had the goal of eliminating the virus. So they shut down all travel, and then they traced all of the new cases, and they got their new case level basically down to, to zero. And so they have a population which is currently isolated because they're not having any travel in or out, but uh, they have a very low percentage uh, population uh, infection level. And so for them, the vaccine will be a key uh, part of it. For all of this information, the IMF has created a, a myeloma patient safety page, and uh, you can log on to that. And we really do have a lot of collected information that we hope will be important and useful for, for everyone. And uh, let me just skip forward uh, to the next segment and we'll have a final uh, Q&A. The, the, the final thing that I want to emphasize as we're looking to the future is that we want everyone to be resilient. Now, this seems like it's become an overused word. Everyone says, well, the, the healthcare workers are resilient and we are so blessed that that is the case. The healthcare workers have saved so, so many people, uh, but uh, the myeloma community and individual myeloma patients also need to be resilient. Now, some people are resilient, but most of us need a little bit of coaching uh, to get to be as resilient as we might be. So the first thing is to say, okay, this is a challenge. Uh, in what way is it challenging? In what way does it affect me? 
In what ways does it affect my family? And how in the world are we going to work through to get through this together? And so it does take some time and some focus and a lot of work, actually, to come up with what are the best uh, solutions uh, to stay safe and to stay sane and to try to have some degree of, of normality. But I do have confidence, despite the fact that there have been a lot of issues in, uh, in the management of, of, of the COVID-19 that we've seen across the U.S., we will get through this together. And uh, myeloma has no borders, and I do love uh, the, 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 the um, comment by David Hockney, uh, who released a number of his uh, paintings recently, uh, is that you cannot cancel the spring. You cannot cancel the spring. The world goes on, and we will catch up with the world. And as was written in the sky by a, 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 by a couple of planes, uh, uh, t two weekends ago, we will get through this together. And we need to stick together and think together and plan together. And uh, if you haven't understood some of the stuff that I've been saying, <laughs> we have a listing of acronyms and myeloma terms and definitions. And uh, you may need these more as we move in to the, uh, the second session. But perhaps uh, we can have some questions uh, closing uh, comments and questions uh, for this first COVID-19 uh, session. So, so perhaps, uh, uh, Bill, what are, what are your uh, big picture thoughts moving forward uh, into this new world? Uh, how, how do you see your myeloma clinic looking in the next uh, six months to a year? Well, I think the clinic uh, will continue uh, because, as you point out, myeloma knows no borders, and patients will continue to be diagnosed and continue to need treatment. But uh, we're going to have to make changes to adapt to this virus. Uh, I think telemedicine, as we've talked about, is going to become much more important. Uh, the universal precautions that many myeloma patients already know are, if anything, going to be more widely adapted, and patients will double down on that to protect themselves. But I think, uh, as Joe has pointed out and you have pointed out, uh, this is not a situation where you want to delay treatment. If you need treatment for active disease, don't delay this because of your fear of this virus. It's much more important that you get treated properly for your myeloma then uh, worry about uh, the risk of this virus. Thank you, yes, I fully agree. And so, Joseph, maybe uh, you comment from uh, your uh, nursing perspective and community sense of what, what do you see uh, in, in that area? Because uh, nursing is a key part of the supportive care and, and uh, the management for myeloma patients when they come into the clinic setting. Well, in Chicago, Brian, uh, we follow strictly the guidance from the mayor and the governor. Um, <laughs> yeah. We are definitely at the mercy of their um, order, and uh, we have had some issues with some of our youth who violated uh, some of the social distancing and got some tickets. So we definitely um, strictly adhere to what the city is uh, telling us to do. Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay, so um, uh, Joe, uh, what, what are you, your thoughts uh, moving forward? I think we need to have uh, a new big picture that is going to emerge, which is not quite like the old picture for taking care of patients with myeloma. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, Brian. And I think this last hour has been balanced. You know, I think there's the part of us that fears the severity of this infection. We have to respect it. But then there's also the reality that in the overwhelming majority of situations, we can take precautions to not get it. Uh, and hopefully, we, as they say, Believe. we won't have to treat it. I think looking forward in the myeloma community, uh, you know, it's, it, I, I feel in some ways, I know it's been overstated, but, you know, like after 9-11, tragically, so many things changed in our lives. And there's the short-term change and the long-term change. And I think in the short term, 
kind of like after 9-11, remember all sorts of things were, were altered quite dramatically for 6 to 12 months. I think over these next 6 to 12 months, we will have some significant changes, more telemedicine, more uh, physical distancing, uh, extra precautions. But I, I do also want to balance that within the long term. You know, I really do believe there is going to be a day where we're going to go back to sports games again. We are going to be able to, um, obviously, with certain precautions, you may have to get used to every time you walk into a store that you use hand sanitizer. You may have to be accustomed right. to uh, certain gatherings being limited in size. But I, I'm also not of a, maybe just because I'm, I'm a positive person by, by nature, I don't sort of feel like the rest of our lives are going to be hung over this COVID. I really do think there will become a time again where if we're smart about it and with the way we're developing vaccines and the way we're aware of what's happened here, um, that we will return to a near normal life. Uh, in the short term for our myeloma patients, we want to take every precaution. But I'm going to conclude by saying one more time, you know, we can't, as someone told me in an analogy this week, you know, if a lion is about to pounce on you, you're not going to be afraid if there's something in the bush that you're going to jump into. We have to deal with myeloma. And thankfully, right. we've had, as we're going to show right now, these amazing treatments to take down this disease, to control it, to give people a better quality and quantity of life. We don't want to dilute that down for fear of something uh, that we can almost always avoid. Absolutely. So could not agree more. And one point that has come up uh, is that uh, particularly right now, it is important to seek uh, guidance uh, from a myeloma expert. And so often we say if, if your local doctor is a little bit uncertain about some of these things that we have been talking about, uh, I think, uh, uh, as you said, uh, Joe, you know, using uh, uh, telemedicine, uh, you, you, you can have these consultations which are actually very effective. And so uh, I would certainly encourage uh, patients to reach out if there are questions and concerns uh, to maybe get that telemedicine in interview. So, so uh, this is actually a plus where, you know, instead of having to travel across the country, uh, uh, this idea of getting a telemedicine consult might become a way uh, uh, of the future and certainly quite important. To get advice okay, can about I just the, add, uh, Brian, that, that that's actually what's been happening to me over the last several weeks. There are patients who wanted to see me, but were not unable to do so because of their uh, either yeah. inability to travel or, or perhaps hesitancy to travel. And and I'm doing, uh, you know, I'm not trying to be a commercial here because we're always busy, but, you know, I'm seeing many consults now remotely uh, with video contact, with the records being sent in advance, you know, through our electronic health record system. Yeah. Um, and pa patients who otherwise could not see a myeloma expert uh, are being able to do so. And we partner well with someone's own oncologist. You know, a patient shouldn't be afraid of that uh, because, if anything, it's a team effort, as we've always said at the IMF, that is going to be able to take care of people's myeloma. Yeah, so thank you for that, Joe. And so please uh, uh, reach out to Joe or actually reach out to any of us uh, uh, directly and certainly always uh, feel free to contact the IMF, email the IMF, call the info line, and we will try to help connect you, uh, well, maybe just give you the information that you need or connect you with uh, uh, people that might be able to uh, advise and guide you. So uh, I think that with that, we will... Uh, finish up on this first uh, segment, and so uh, we do. Do as they say uh, on the TV: uh, uh, stay right there, uh, but do take a quick stretch. Uh, and if you need a bio break, just for a moment, we'll just take a, 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 a very brief uh, uh, break here for two, three minutes, okay? And we'll we'll catch right up. Okay, uh, especially for the panel here. So we'll get started back up here in just a second, okay? Sounds good. So, uh, by the way, uh, we were able to check that 64% um, uh, of the people on the call were actually able to answer the question. So it seems like most people had figured out how to to do that, which is, is really excellent. Uh, that's, that's great, Brian. Do we know how many are on? Well, it's over 1,000. Uh, there was, well, 1,245 were started, but... Yeah, 1,245. So that's fantastic. That might be our best attended meeting ever. That's impressive. 
Okay, so uh, I'm going to get started back up with uh, uh, session two. Uh, for those who are taking a longer bio break, uh, there'll just be a little bit of an intro here, so so not to worry. So so session two, uh, as uh, Joe just referenced, is about um, the the regular management of myeloma, and we want to get back to that uh, as in, in full force as possible, and so. Uh, for our new patients, uh, as always, we're looking for what is the best uh, initial therapy or frontline therapy, and uh, I'll be very keen to hear uh, feedback from our panel about this, but uh, I'm just going to give uh, an overview. Obviously, in the frontline setting, the initial therapy uh, can be with the idea of transplant and maintenance, as I show on slide number 42, or uh, if, if a transplant is not planned, consolidation and maintenance therapy with supportive care such as uh, the Zomeda or, um, or the like for ongoing uh, uh, su supportive management. On this particular slide, I reference something that comes out every year. Uh, Vincent Rajkumar uh, has an annual clinical update where he updates um, the diagnosis, risk stratification, and management for myeloma, which actually is a quite nice compact uh, overview summary. And so it is an open journal. And so if you click on that, you actually get the full uh, article. So I think it is an excellent, very current uh, overview just published this past week, as a matter of fact. And so the main thing uh, which most of the, the, the patients who've been dealing with myeloma for a number of years are aware of is that in, in the old days, we had very few options for the management of myeloma. But now, in the frontline setting all the way, and particularly in the relapse setting, we have uh, so many uh, options available, we have to double check to make sure if we've got them all listed there. And under the immune therapies, I was only able just to put immune therapies, not all of the different types of immune therapies that we have that we'll talk about a little bit later. But focusing on what is new and current in the frontline setting, uh, we've sh shifted to now basically some type of a triple therapy option, which would be Velcade combined with thalidomide or Revlimid or Kyprolis with Revlimid or um, Ixazomib with Revlimid, all of them with dexamethasone. But the new focus is whether or not it's better to combine that triplet with uh, daratumumab. And so that has been a big focus of research in these past uh, several years. And so in the frontline setting, uh, the questions become which triplet to choose, and then uh, do you combine that triplet with uh, daratumumab, which since it's now available as a sub-Q shot, makes it a whole lot easier. And so uh, the daratumumab, uh, we do have, and what I'm going to show you for these various drugs that we're talking about, just to keep everyone as informed as possible, we do have understanding booklets for um, all of these drugs separately uh, just so that you can read about them at your leisure but daratumumab is an antibody, a monoclonal antibody against uh, CD38, which is strongly expressed on the surface of myeloma. Uh, the Darzelex uh, is available as a, as a sub-Q shot and has this name, FASTPRO. I'm not quite sure where that name came from. It seems like FASTPRO. I don't know. Uh, but Obviously, DARA is now approved broadly in the front line and all the way to relapse, and is, is generally very well uh, tolerated. And so a lot of interest at the last ASH in a study called the Griffin trial, where daratumumab was combined with VRD, which is pretty much a standard of care in the front line setting, with really excellent results. And so I think that this trial and a number of others will lead to a consideration of using DARA VRD as a first option in the frontline setting. Now, uh, right now, uh, people are talking about, at least briefly, uh, to use uh, exazomib because this can certainly be used as an ongoing uh, maintenance. It's oral, 
and it is easy to combine. And so there's been some discussion that in the short term to reduce the risks if a patient is not having aggressive disease that uh, they can use uh, Nenlaro, uh, particularly in, uh, in a maintenance setting uh, if, you're, if you're beyond the initial induction to, to substitute Nenlaro. Uh, and so if we just go to the first uh, uh, assessment uh, of what is recommended for frontline therapy right now, uh, if there's no transplant planned, uh, the simple options are to use Revlimid Index or Valcade Melphalan very little used in the United States, uh, uh, but actually what is used more is just VRD, even in uh, no transplant candidates, or a new option, which is to use Daratumumab Revlimid Index instead of Valcade Revlimid Index. And so for patients who are uh, transplant candidates, the big question right now is whether or not to combine in the daratumumab to give what we call a quadruplet or a four-drug combination, uh, and then to move forward uh, either with uh, uh, the, 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 the tr transplant or with ongoing maintenance. Uh, the maintenance would normally be lanolidomide, which is revlimid, uh, with or without um, a proteasome inhibitor, which could be nanlaro particularly for a high-risk patient. Uh, in general, uh, and this can be discussed, uh, uh, transplant is still routinely uh, recommended in the frontline setting for patients who are able to uh, go through that and who uh, are personally uh, wanting to do that. Uh, and uh, so I'll be interested in uh, the perspectives on that if, if that is still the standard approach, which I believe is is the case, and so uh, if we uh, uh, take a moment to talk about frontline options, uh, 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 Bill, perhaps uh, you might be the best to start on this in terms of the selection for um, your first line treatment, and then uh, the the routine nature or not of of the recommendation for autologous stem cell transplant. Okay. Uh, thank you, Brian. Um, so I am a believer in triplets. I think three drug combinations have proven to be superior to two drugs for their efficacy and uh, 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 speed as well. Um, there is data, as you alluded to, adding daratumumab to triplets that looks promising. Um, I don't do that routinely at this time. But I think uh, the results of these trials e examining the addition of daratumumab will probably cha uh, result in uh, a change in practice in uh, the coming years. Once a patient has received their initial therapy, if they are considered a transplant candidate, we generally do recommend moving on to transplant because of its proven benefit in terms of response, disease control, and even survival benefits. However, in this time of the COVID crisis, there is a concern about uh, whether or not a transplant should be done right away. And the reasons are clear. Um, you can't socially distance as well when you're undergoing a transplant. You can't have a telemedicine visit because you need to come to the clinic daily for labs and for IV fluids. We do most of our transplants as outpatients, uh, but especially if you're going to be hospitalized, um, that is a limitation because the concern is that you could catch the virus there. In addition, patients become more immunosuppressed and become very neutropenic because of the transplant. Now, I, I should emphasize that most hospitals that do transplants take extra precautions to ensure the safety of these patients. Uh, patients who are known to have COVID or suspected to have COVID are basically treated in different areas of the hospital. So there's no interaction and there's no risk for patients who are hospitalized for transplants. 
Having said that, many okay. of tr the transplant centers have temporarily suspended doing transplants because of their concern about risks. Although I understand this is uh, changing uh, in the next few weeks. But I think whether or not you should have a transplant is an individual decision that you uh, need to talk to your uh, physician, especially the one who will be undertaking your transplant, and discuss, frankly, the risks and fears you have about uh, the COVID crisis and how it might impact you as a patient. Um, we have not uh, stopped doing transplants, but we do take extra precautions screening potential patients, and then I have a frank discussion with each patient who uh, is concerned about COVID. And if patients have real fears and concerns, by all means, I advise them to delay the transplant. If it's a significant delay of a month or more, I usually recommend maintenance therapy so that disease can be kept at bay in this short time interval. But uh, it, it is very much an individual decision uh, based on your own circumstances and your own uh, transplant clinic's policies about whether to proceed to transplant at this time. Yeah, very, very good. So I think that's a, a very, very comprehensive uh, summary. So, so perhaps, Joe, uh, some, some, any additional thoughts on that? I think that... Uh... Uh, no, I think I think Bill has, has highlighted it particularly well, especially the transplant issue. You know, it, it goes with our theme that we don't abandon myeloma treatment because of COVID by any means. But you know what? That that fairly complicated slide that you mentioned from from Vincent's uh, uh, summary, I, I would even simplify it more. I would say currently today, and probably until early 2021, the standard of care for a frontline patient is almost always going to be VRD. The two exceptions yep. to that would be if you are not going to transplant, it's clear from the outset, then a consideration could be for DRD or daratumumab with Landex. My hesitation right. would there would be if someone has high-risk myeloma, I think that is the one weakness to the DRD regimen. Even though you're giving right. two novel agents indefinitely, I would go with BRD. In the transplant eligible population, I know we'll hear the results of the endurance study in a couple of weeks at ASCO, which compared carfilzomib Landex to bortezomib Landex. And even though that re those results will be helpful, remember those were in non high risk patients. One right. could consider giving KRD, especially in a high risk patient, going to transplant. So, in summary, if you're going to a transplant, it's, it's generally VRD, possibly KRD if you're high risk. If you're not going to a transplant, it's either VRD or DRD, and if you have high risk, I would suggest VRD. Looking beyond 2021, or, or starting as soon as the end of this year, Brian, I do think that we will be adding daratumumab to VRD. I think the Griffin study just published will not by itself influence uh, the FDA's decision because it will, it will likely need a more broad study, which is un being undergone. Uh, but nonetheless, I think we are recognizing deeper remission early on with, with a heavier combination is likely going to lead to a bigger outcome. And so we'll probably see more people getting DVRD and then maintenance with daratumab and lalitabine. Right, right. Absolutely. Very good. So let's let's move on then. So uh, so quickly. What what about maintenance? Uh, maintenance is is relatively straightforward. Um, it would either be with uh, Revlimid, which is strongly recommended, and so for patients with high risk features, add in a, a proteasome inhibitor, which uh, these days can be uh, Velcade or uh, Nenlaro, modified for side effects. Again, a consideration of of stopping it for uh, for the COVID crisis, but actually, uh, and uh, this was pretty interesting. Uh, many people may have seen this. Um, Rafat Abinar um, uh, tweeted uh, about 10 days ago about one of his patients uh, who was COVID-19 positive, who was on Revlimid maintenance uh, and was doing absolutely fine. And so, to the extent that we have become aware, it doesn't seem like uh, these treatments that we're using for myeloma uh, are actually a serious negative in terms of uh, of uh, maintenance uh, therapy uh, for a patient who's in remission. 
Uh, anyone have any uh, comments about that, the, the aspects of uh, maintenance right now? Uh, okay to continue with maintenance uh, for, for the time being? I would say uh, yes, Brian. There was one guideline that came out of Europe that suggested that people stop maintenance at six cycles, but most of us responded to that saying we don't have evidence for that. I think we do know that maintenance prolongs people's remission and even survival, uh, and so I have not been adjusting maintenance therapy because of it. I would continue the plan as, as was before. We may see people a little less frequently, uh, we now can, for example, obtain lenalidomide right. for two months at a time as opposed to exactly. usually it's only a one-month prescription. That's been really helpful. But in general, right. we have not changed our strategy. Absolutely. So, I would echo so, uh, that. Okay, yeah, continuing with maintenance, yeah. Uh, I think so. I think we've all been doing that and really without any indication of, of concerns except related to the blood counts uh, uh, and, and potentially the dosage uh, in a few patients. Okay, so um, relapse, so this has been a big area, and even right now with the COVID crisis, we need to look very, very closely at the options because if a patient is relapsing, they do need new therapy. And so we need to look closely at what are our different options. And again, uh, I'm showing you this uh, algorithm, which as uh, Joe mentioned, these are algorithms that do come from Vincent Rajkumar, uh, which he presents at our uh, ASH symposium and are actually included in this article that I referenced at the beginning of this uh, session too. And so uh, the big thing in the relapse setting is if a patient has received, uh, as Joe was indicating, uh, VRD and might have become refractory to lenalidomide, the Revlimid, what are the options? And so obviously a key thing there would be to shift over to uh, palmolidomide or uh, daratumumab, or we have a variety of other options now, including uh, uh, isotuximab with palmolidomide dex, uh, which is a, a recently approved uh, regimen. For patients, uh, and uh, another key one which uh, was, was recently approved, uh, which is uh, I don't know if we should have these brackets there, but uh, daratumumab KD, which was the Candor regimen, is also uh, very active in the refractory setting, but it, you, you'll notice that it's also over on the other side because it's an important choice if you're refractory to Revlimid or not. And so if you're not refractory to lenalidomide, then you can continue and take uh, daratumumab or Kyprolis, so daratumumab, Revlimid and Dex, DRD, or Kyprolis, Revlimid and Dex, uh, if you're not refractory to the Revlimid. And then, of course, we have these other uh, possible uh, options there. So really, uh, a, a large number of options which become uh, personal choices in discussions, very, what I would recommend, very careful discussions uh, between the doctor and the patient about the pros and cons of different things. Obviously, the Kyprolis is very active, and it has a, an advantage of being emit-free. Uh, right now, the Kyprolis could be given weekly, and we do have daratumumab on a sub-Q basis. And so I'm interested to see, and, and we thought this would be uh, an interesting question, this combination from the Candor trial, Kyprolis, daratumumab, and dexamethasone was recently approved, and we were just interested to see how many patients have actually uh, been uh, switched over or needed to take this particular relapse regimen. So if you could answer that question, that would be great. If you haven't heard of any of that, you probably have not taken it. <laughs> okay, so we're trying to see. All right, so thus far that's running at 3%. So 
Uh, for this group, that means it's about 30 or 40 uh, people, possibly, uh, that have been taking it. So it's early days. There was just an approval relatively recently, and particularly in this difficult uh, time. So uh, this is a this is the starting point for that regimen. Obviously, the the next slide just shows you uh, the actual data where the length of the um, the PFS or the remission was significantly improved. The, the blue line on slide 57 uh, of the three drug combination versus the two drug uh, Kyprolis and Dex by itself. So clearly uh, an important thing. And this is a broad thing that maybe uh, there can be discussion on. Using a triplet in the relapse setting versus a doublet does seem to be an advantage, not just for this regimen, but whatever regimen uh, might be selected which could include, for example, the next slide uh, is a tuximab, which is an alternate uh, anti-CD38 uh, monoclonal antibody, which is uh, currently IV, and it is approved as uh, is a tuximab palmolidomide index. And so uh, this is something that can be uh, a helpful combination to consider early on also. Uh, and so other uh, agents which... Uh, have been uh, uh, considered in the relapse setting, and, and and I mentioned this one in particular because we are hopeful that uh, what's called Bella, B-E-L-A, the first part of that very long uh, word along the top there, uh, I don't know why uh, the, uh, some of the companies do stick with those very long uh, names, and then we have to abbreviate it to just Bella. But this is an anti BCMA monoclonal antibody drug conjugate, uh, which is uh, because of the drug conjugate, it can uh, even work if the uh, BCMA uh, level of expression on the surface of the myeloma is relatively low. Uh, it also recruits uh, the immune cells in the microenvironment to attack the myeloma. This has a big advantage of being an immune therapy which is off the shelf, and so uh, much less cumbersome to go into the clinic and get this uh, Bella. Uh, it does have uh, some corneal toxicities, which are uh, now largely manageable since they're understood a lot better. And moving forward, a lot of different uh, combinations of dream, what are called the dream protocols are, are ongoing. Uh, now, important to be aware, I thought I would emphasize this on slide number 60, uh, the expanded access uh, program for this, while we're awaiting uh, FDA approval, is open, and so this should be an agent that can be available for relapse patients who, who might need it. And this uh, cartoon here just shows you that um, when the antibody binds to the cell, the drug uh, gets imported, gets uh, pushed into the cell and adds to the more rapid destruction of the myeloma cell, which is uh, great. Uh, and then just briefly to show you that uh, in the relapse setting, uh, the results with this uh, as a single agent were really uh, quite uh, excellent, 60% uh, overall response rate with some very, very deep responses down to that 100% response level. Even in double refractory uh, and uh, DARA refractory patients, heavily pretreated patients, and so this is uh, uh, it will be approved in that more refractory re relapse setting for sure, where it does have substantial activity. Uh, just to touch on one of the other uh, drugs that are available as part of a combo, implicity, a elotuzumab, well tolerated, and uh, again combined with pomalidomide and Dex is an option in this relapse uh, setting. And then in the more advanced uh, relapse setting where it was first approved, uh, Selenexor, with a novel mechanism of action um, in triple refractory, has the advantage of being oral uh, and even perhaps antiviral. And so a lot of excitement recently about Selenexor because it was uh, noted to be both an oral agent and with maybe some antiviral activity with, with, with studies opening across the uh, country. Uh, and now uh, we have uh, good evidence supporting combination uh, use since the Boston trial where it was combined with a uh, Valcade was, was released. And so uh, one question we have, the cell in XR has been approved for a number of months now. And so one of the questions is, 
How many patients have been taking Selenexor? Uh-oh, let's see. Seven. Oh, 1%. Oh. All right, well, that's, uh, I guess that's 10 patients. So for some reason, I would think that there would be more patients that were taking uh, Selenexor, but maybe uh, not in this group. Uh, we, we do know that uh, a lot of patients who are on our calls are patients who have been doing well and maybe are not uh, in that relapse situation where they might be looking uh, so anxiously for a new uh, treatment uh, option. Uh, and then just to finish up the, the presentation of all these different options uh, in the relapse setting, there are many, many options uh, currently available uh, uh, beyond these triplets that I've mentioned and then moving into the immune therapies and of course all of the different uh, clinical trials. A big issue right now is that many of the trials have been in a holding pattern, and we are uh, waiting anxiously, anxiously for those to be opening back up uh, in later in May and June, and we're des desperately hoping that this will be a return uh, toward uh, normality. Uh, and so um, uh, maybe, uh, Joe, you could uh, maybe talk first about... Um, how do you sort through all of these different options in in, in the relapse setting when you uh, have now a number of these different triplet combinations uh, to consider? Yeah, I, I mean, the first statement, of course, is that it, it's it's nice to have more options, right? The more options, right. the better, because even though I really simplified frontline therapy, relapse therapy becomes a lot more complicated. But but it's good. It's good to have choice. And we basically do it based on what treatment the patient has had before, what other comorbidities they might have, or uh, whether they have high risk or standard risk disease, and really what their preferences are. Now that we do have choices, there are times when, as we've been discussing throughout this whole call, there are times when you, we may be able to go to or, or an oral regimen or a subcutaneous regimen. So I think all of those things factor in. I, I would say that maybe one of the things from the scientific side that pushes us is if someone has had a VRD-like regimen, we do like to go to the other classes of drugs. So almost always we will use daratumumab in the relapse setting at first relapse in combination with something else. I would probably say that in Vincent's slide, I might disagree with how many of his combinations at the top were focused on adding uh, bortezomib or Velcade to it. I think right now the more common thing we're seeing is a lot of people are getting daratumumab plus pomalidomide or may soon be getting esetuximab plus pomalidomide at that first relapse. Absolutely, darapomdex. Yeah, so that's yeah, that attractive because you have sub-Q dara now and then pomalidomide by mouth, obviously. Absolutely. And and the other one, of course, as you well outlined, is Candor. And I think we will see a lot of daratumumab, carfilzomib dex um, as it comes forward. You know, to be very transparent, the approval for daratumumab subcutaneously was technically only for new patients and in almost all of their filings, not quite Candor, because Candor had been had come a bit afterwards, but we are expecting, as we discuss this with regulatory authorities and, and uh, uh, insurance companies, that basically people should be able to transition from IV to sub-Q. It may take a little while for that to happen because technically right. the approval was for people starting new, but, but looking ahead, and, and there's a lot of incentive, of course, with COVID to now go to sub-Q, which is so much shorter. It's a five-minute uh, subcutaneous infusion instead of, uh, instead of the you know, hours and hours that we used to do for, for DARA. So I guess to summarize, Brian, I think we really are switching classes or adding a different class um, with most people getting something like VRD with lenalidomide maintenance, we're seeing a lot of dara palm decks, but we're going to see more dara carfilzomib decks and uh, even isatuximab palm decks at that earlier relapse. And then, of course, later there's lots of, uh, uh, of options yeah. whether we bring in Selenex or not. Right, exactly, exactly. So, uh, uh, Bill, maybe you could just comment on your favorite uh, combination. So we've got Dara Palm Dex, uh, we have uh, uh, Dara Kyprolis Dex, and then one that uh, Joe didn't emphasize, which we've actually studied together, is Kyprolis 
uh, palmalidomide decks, which is actually a pretty active regimen. So what, what, what are your favorites uh, in that uh, kind of one to three relapse setting, the earlier relapse setting? No favorites. <laughs> All right, well, um, uh, we'll come back to Bill. I don't know why he didn't pick up on that. A question that I had for, for Joseph, actually, is the, the obviously Selenexor is, is, is quite active in, in that relapse setting, uh, and it is oral, but it has mm -hmm. um, challenging and different side effects. Um, uh, how much uh, of an issue have you seen that to be uh, in, in patients that, that, that you're involved with? Uh, uh, managing uh, Selenexor, which patients want to take because it can give benefit, uh, but then the challenges of the side effects. Correct. So it's important that when a patient starts on a treatment that all of the potential side effects, such as in Selenexor, would be the gastrointestinal or um, issues that there's, you know, diarrhea that could be up to five to six times a day, that that's proactively been um, managed and that the patient has been, uh, has received an educational uh, session uh, for starting a, chemo, a new chemotherapy. It's really important the patient will understand about the different parameters in terms of when to call um, the clinic and when to come to the clinic for an urgent um, visit for checkup and then for electrolyte uh, imbalances as well because we know that when someone has a three or four uh, watery diarrhea it doesn't stop with just dehydration it can also lead to electrolyte imbalances and it may need some supplementation in an IV form so uh, I think that you know it's important that the patient will receive a handout and also uh, important um, information and reminders in terms of what to call, who to call, and then um, what to do when a uh, certain number of episodes have happened. Absolutely. Uh, Brian, and so, I, uh, Joe, 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 yeah, Joe yeah. you've got a lot of experience with this, so do you want to comment? And uh, you, you yeah. wrote, a, wrote a paper about it, too. Yeah, we've, we've just had a paper published. We had a group of us uh, physicians and, and nurses and nurse practitioners that uh, have treated a lot of patients with Selenexor. I mean, obviously, I can't recount the whole paper, but I completely agree with you what you said, Joseph. I think what I try and explain to every single patient that comes to see me is the first month is both the most important and the worst month. The first month is the toughest month with this drug. It's a very potent drug, and it can really help people in the long run. And the fact that it's just a pill that you take either once or twice a week can be extremely helpful. But that first month is critical. In fact, I encourage all physicians to make sure that they see patients every week for that first month to make sure that their nausea is under control, that they're eating correctly, that they're not having the diarrhea that Joseph mentioned. Because if we can get people through that first month, they can very much do well in the long term. And a big part of it is not waiting for those things to happen. Every patient with Selenexor should be getting dexamethasone, get a significant anti-nauseant, and I even use something called olanzapine, and we agreed as a group that this is something that we do. All these three together help both reduce nausea and encourage a better appetite because what happens with a lot of these patients is they don't really want to eat, and that's what leads them to losing some weight and, and getting very fatigued. So it can be a bit tricky. We're seeing now as we do more trials with Selenexor where we use it in combination and we only give the drug once weekly that a lot of these side effects become less significant. So sometimes we do have to dose reduce to once weekly. We start usually with twice weekly. But this can be managed, but it really takes extra care that first month. But you get through that first month, things can get significantly smoother thereafter. Yeah, Absolutely. thanks so much for that, Joel. And, and so if there are questions on the line who have uh, concerns about all this, so please follow up with this and we'll get you uh, details of those proactive recommendations and supplements and different things that can really make a big difference. So uh, thank you, uh, Joe and Joseph, for that. And uh, we'll, we'll move forward. Uh, all right. So um, the last part is just to evaluate where are we with immune therapies. And so uh, the immune therapies, as I uh, indicate here on slide number 67, 
they really dominated ASH, our American Society of Hematology meeting that was uh, in December in Florida, uh, with presentations about the CAR T therapies, the bispecific T cell engagers, and also some of that data that I just showed you about the Bellamap, the monoclonal monoclonal antibody drug conjugate. So just to focus on, on the CAR T cells, and this has been an important topic in the uh, during this COVID crisis, is that this CAR T therapy, it does seem like it is going to be a game changer. Uh, what you do is you insert, you, you take the uh, immune cells from the patient, the T cells, and you engineer them such that they will attack the myeloma. And in this particular case, uh, the engineering is toward the BCMA, which is on the surface of the myeloma, the B-cell maturation antibody, which is strongly expressed on the myeloma. And so if you engineer the T-cells, it specifically makes them attack the myeloma with lots of this BCMA on the surface. Well, at the time of the presentations in ASH, I think that many people noticed the slight pause uh, in the presentation of Dr. Deepu Maduri, who presented the CAR-T protocol from the Legend J&J &J product and from the results of the CARTITUDE trial, where she emphasized that actually all the patients in the study responded 100% response rate. And all of those deep blue bars, that indicates 100% response rate. And you'll see that a few patients on the left didn't go all the way down to the bottom, but most of them on what's called this waterfall type of plot had really dramatic uh, improvement with redu reduced uh, what we call tumor burden. The myeloma really just dropped uh, dramatically. Now, this is being compared with uh, monoclonal antibodies, and in this case, uh, in slide 70, with one that's called a T-cell engager, where it's anti-BCMA, but it also pulls the T-cell in to, to attack the myeloma. So this is kind of a, uh, a combo, and in the product from, uh, it's a bispecific uh, combination. And in the presentation at ASH, as you increase the dose, the depth of the response got better and better. And so this turned out to be another very, very powerful immune approach, which seems very encouraging. And so we have the, the Bella product, which is a drug conjugate. We have the CAR T cells, and then we have the um, bispecific uh, products. Uh, they're clearly very active. And uh, it's a question of, uh, number one, uh, uh, we're looking towards uh, the hope for approval in the relapse setting, uh, but also the idea that this sort of a dramatic ter therapy could be used uh, for consolidation early or even uh, a, a, as a, a therapy in the early uh, relapse uh, setting. And so as we're looking in closing here to what all of our expectations are, uh, Potential new approvals, well, that GSK uh, Bella product, uh, we're hoping for that. Among the CAR T cells, uh, the data from uh, cell gene BMS, the BB2121 CAR T product, uh, has been uh, submitted, and I believe that the legend CAR T uh, material will also be submitted at some point later this year. It is important to note, uh, and maybe uh, Joe and Bill or, or Joseph uh, all can comment that that these trials have been discontinued for the time being, and uh, we have to see how that type of therapy will uh, look moving forward. We do have uh, other agents, uh, malflufin, which is a new, a novel type of malfilan, which is quite active and uh, is uh, taken up by the cells. And then we're going to get these results, which were touched upon with the triple therapies, where uh, the triple therapies combined with DARA where it'll allow us to say, well, should we switch over to a DARA combination in the frontline setting? And then a number of newer agents. Uh, we have been excited about Benetoclax for quite a long time, but the, the studies got sidetracked a little bit by some of the complications in the combination trials. But nonetheless, Benetoclax, a very active agent, and we're looking forward to uh, trial results that would allow us to move forward with that. 
And obviously the cell mods, iberdamide, a, a, a drug which is kind of like an imid, which is called a cell mod, uh, also quite uh, quite exciting. And so uh, perhaps uh, in, a, in a final session, I can maybe get the perspective of, uh, of each of you about uh, particularly the the new immune therapies. Uh, what do you see the future holds for CAR T, for the the Bella product, uh, which probably will be the first to get approved, and then a number of these biospecifics that are moving uh, forward. Uh, so, so Bill, if you are you back on the line, maybe you could comment on what do you think about all those immune therapies? Thanks, Brian. Um, I think these immune therapies have the potential to be game changers. I mean, the, the, as you pointed out, the dramatic response rates that we're seeing with these agents that vary from belanamib with 60% response to nearly 100% response with some of the CAR T cells uh, really indicate the high degree of efficacy and, and activity of these agents. Uh, it's still a challenge, though, I think, about where we're going to use these. Um, by and large, the CAR T cells are not curative for most patients because even with these dramatic responses, by about a year, the majority of patients will relapse. Now, keep in mind, this is just the beginning of these agents. We're just at the very... Uh, beginning of, of these immunotherapies. If uh, to paraphrase, uh, this is not the uh, the end. It's the uh, beginning of the end uh, in oh, terms sure, sure. of what sure. these drugs can do. So we're going to have new iterations of these CAR T cells. The bite molecules are undergoing development as well, and I think these therapies are going to move their way earlier and earlier in the in the treatment, and I do think have the potential down the line to be uh, curative for patients. Very, very good. And so, what do you? How do you view uh, what will probably be the case, which will be the earlier approval of the GSK product? How do you see that figuring in your recommendations or practice? Well, it'll. It'll get used, obviously, in, it, in whatever the indication is, and it's likely to be a third line or beyond therapy initially. But there already are uh, studies underway using this in combination with the other approved drugs. And so, right. similar to daratumumab, it's going to move its way forward uh, eventually for frontline therapy. Yes, yes. So, so Joe, what, what's your perspective about all of this? Yeah, I, I mean, I agree very much with Bill. I mean, to, to think of it in a time frame, we're going to have Belantamab, Mafodotin, or Bella very soon, we hope. And I think it will have an, a significant impact in that it'll be the first BCMA product, so the first drug that works on that BCMA marker on the outside of the myeloma cell. And I think what we're seeing is by the time people have had two lines of therapy, they will have had a proteasome inhibitor, an immunomodulatory drug, and uh, a CD38 antibody. So it will be very attractive to now go to another class. Uh, it could be cell and XOR by then, but also I think this, this is where the GSK product is really going to hit. And just like Bill said, it's going to start by itself, but then it's going to start being used in combination. I think looking a little bit further, when CAR-T makes its way in, and I do think that, as Bill said, CAR-T has the opportunity for a much deeper response. However, it's still going to, it still needs a lot of work because people do relapse afterwards. And it's still, honestly, Brian, a bit of a boutique therapy. I mean, we still have difficulty getting people a simple autologous stem cell transplant. People have to go to a highly trained center, the, the, have to wait three weeks for the product to be made. Now, these things may get better with time, but I think that CAR-T is not going to be sort of necessarily widespread use in myeloma, but will be used earlier in the disease course, in particular in younger and higher risk patients uh, where this is going to be more feasible. And then lastly, I'm quite encouraged by the new bispecific antibodies, and there are so many of them now. You showed one or two of them, but there are so many more coming that basically is, is, is a diet version of CAR-T. Same concept of CAR-T of, 
of engaging a T cell, but not having to go through all the production and the stem cell, or sorry, the, the T cell collection and so on. So, but that's going to be a few years out. We'll see it in, in trial. So I think people will have Bella over the next six to 12 months, initially by itself, and then in some combinations. We're going to see CAR T cell therapy evolve, get better, used earlier. And in the long term, people will get the biospecifics. I think we're going to end up seeing, in conclusion then, Brian, that many patients will almost consistently be on a monoclonal antibody, daratumumab up front, maybe a BCMA or a SLAMF7 drug like elotuzumab at first or second relapse, in combination, always having a monoclonal antibody plus um, other classes of drugs together. And, and the more classes we get, like combinations we can create, it will give us better options for patients and tailor it to their needs and indeed to their preferences. Thank you. Yeah, I fully agree with these comments, I have to say. So, so Joseph, uh, uh, on your side of it, obviously the CAR-T has a lot of implications in terms of care. Uh, how, how do you view the CAR-T and the other immune therapies? I, I concur with both Bill and um, Joe that definitely this CAR-T is still not readily available to many patients. It's still like a boutique kind of treatment, and it requires specialty training. It, it requires uh, resources and um, highly qualified staff. And so what we learn in multiple myeloma is that convenience is a major factor in the treatment decision-making. So if yeah. there's other alternatives or other options that are readily available, I would predict that this will be it in the back burner unless you are really at the center that offers that uh, CAR T cell. So. Right, right, right. So I think that's a very important perspective is that especially for our more elderly patients and, and the like, and especially uh, at this time with the COVID-19, convenience and safety are going to uh, end up being quite important in, in the decision-making process. So so thank you for that. So, uh, so uh, let's uh, move forward with any uh, final thoughts. Um, uh, I'm getting shown some different questions that I'm, I'm trying to uh, cover up any uh, cover uh, any questions that came in. Uh, uh, someone is asking, uh, and Bill, maybe you can just touch on this. Uh, if a second transplant, uh, this is coming in out of left field, is a second transplant. Uh, 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 treatment option in the relapse setting, and so maybe just touch on that for a moment. So there, there is data on second transplants, and in general, uh, if you get a relatively long remission, and that's defined as two years or more with your first transplant, a second transplant can often be a good option for you uh, at a at a future relapse point. The other thing to Keep in mind about a, another transplant is it, is it may be a way to restore stem cell function and reset the clock, if you will. Oftentimes, yeah. patients who have very advanced myeloma have difficulties with uh, pancytopenia, which is a low blood counts across the board, both from their disease and from the prior treatment. And if you do a second transplant, you can often restore their uh, bone marrow function and at the same time at least get temporary control. And while this isn't a long-term solution for these patients, it may allow them to go forward to a trial, perhaps one of Absolutely. the immunotherapies. Absolutely. Uh, several very, very important points there, particularly uh, kind of recovering the bone marrow reserves, a very important point. Uh, I have one other question which people can comment on. Uh, 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 a spouse is asking if uh, uh, I think our husband uh, has achieved a fantastic remission, and uh, I, I'm assuming it's probably MRD negative. Uh, how would uh, they know that... Um, uh, it's been MRD negative for one year that he's cured, uh, or would it be after two years or out to five years? So, so actually, maybe I can take that question myself. Uh, so, uh, we're m very much focused on the value of uh, MRD testing in predicting a long-term outcome, and in fact, 
uh, we're in the process of trying to seek uh, FDA approval to accept it as a deep response uh, endpoint. However, that is very different than us saying that we feel for sure that a patient is uh, is cured. Uh, so what we know is that patients who are MRD negative, what we know so far, MRD negative for let's say four years or five years, there are different trials to show this, they are likely to have very uh, long and sustained remissions. However, uh, that doesn't guarantee that at some point there might not be some uh, reoccurrence of the disease. And so um, we're still a little bit cautious about using this word uh, cure, although we're a lot more keen to say that the outcome is likely to be very, very good and that there will be excellent length of remission. There will probably be excellent survival. And one of the things that we have not emphasized overall for these last two hours is that there has been dramatic improvement in the overall expected survival for patients with myeloma. And so now when a patient is diagnosed, there will be an early remission of four or five years that there could be a long remission with first relapse. And so now instead of talking about survivals of three, four, five years, we're talking about survivals of twice that. And it's not uncommon to have patients out in the 15 or even 20 year time frame, but we're still very cautious about considering them to be uh, necessarily cured. Uh, uh, and we sometimes use this word functional cure to say that um, maybe uh, they're not really cured, but I mean, does it make a difference because they're doing so well for such a long time? So anyway, perhaps that's just a good uh, topic to, to finish for, uh, for today. Um, and uh, I've switched over for some of the acronyms and abbreviations. We've given you some links, uh, and that's important. And again, I would like to uh, thank our uh, sponsors. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. And so uh, let me just go back uh, from uh, uh, our panel, uh, Dr. Bill Benzinger from Seattle, Dr. Joe McHale from uh, Phoenix, and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Joseph Terman from Chicago, thanks to the three of you for really, really helpful and insightive, insightive com comments and insightful comments. Do you have any final words of wisdom uh, that you would like to convey, uh, Bill? <laughs> I just, I just want to thank you and the IMF for having these programs. I think they're extremely valuable to patients and family members. Well, thank you for that, Bill. Uh, we we certainly hope so, and that's that's what we're striving for. That's for sure. And uh, and Joe, uh, well, uh, <laughs> great great advertisement for us, Bill. It's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I'm such I'm privileged to be a part of this organization. I would really encourage the listeners to uh, go to myeloma.org. There's a wealth of resources there. The info line is open every day during the weekday. Um, whether it's a general question or a specific question, we do our very best to, to try and educate you. We want you, as we've said this whole two hours, we want you to feel like part of this community. You're not alone. We're all in this together, and uh, we can absolutely help as you uh, go through your myeloma journey. Well, thank you for that, Joe. And, and Joseph, what, what, what comes to your mind? Thank you again. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you so much for inviting me, and, and for all the myeloma patients out there, always remember that um, you always have someone, and that could be the International Myeloma Foundation, your patient support group, or your neighbor. You can have a good quality of life with multiple myeloma with so many treatment options now. When I think back in 2000, when I started multiple myeloma, there were just very few options. I think that... Uh, Always stay positive. Absolutely. I could not agree more. And so thank you for that. And so as we close, let me just say stay safe, stay connected, and stay positive. And uh, with some help, try to be as resilient as you can, even though you may not feel resilient every single day, but aim for that. Uh, and we we thank you for your involvement and questions coming in today. And uh, I'll turn it over to I think Robin, who would like to make some closing comments. 
Well, thank you, Dr. Dury, and thanks to all the presenters today. Your, your information it was clear and informative, and I've just been monitoring some of the questions coming in, and I'd like to quickly just show the IMF website. So we are going to myloma.org right now, and some okay. of the questions that came in, um, people are really interested in finding out where the replay for this will be. So we're first going to go to the main page of the website. And then if we scroll down, and you'll have to bear with us, it's a little shaky when we're showing this to you. Um, here's the main page, here we go. And now we're scrolling down and you see COVID-19. Oh wait, okay, here we go. Amira is, um, we're trying to do this carefully. <laughs> go ahead Amira, keep going. So right here where it says patient and family webinar, if you want to download the slides, some of you I know like to print these out and take your notes on them. And sometimes if you're at a support group, you like to replay these webinars. So that's where you'll be able to access the replay of the webinar, as well as downloading the slides. You can see the blue button right there where you could download the slides. And then Amira, if we could go back and show where the first session that we discussed was on COVID-19. And I know a lot of people had questions on where can they find that resource. So this block go. right here that we're looking at, if you just, you don't, we won't click on it here to save time, but if you click on this block, there's a tremendous amount of resources here. Every week, Dr. Dury is writing blogs as well as doing videos and lots of great resources and content here from our pharma partners as well. And I also saw that many of you were asking about where can you find your local support group. So back up to the top of the IMF page, if you see this little square that says resources and support, when you hover on that, you'll see this drop down box. And the first thing on there is find a support group. And if you click on find a support group, you'll come up with the next page that'll show, we'll scroll down here. It'll show a map and it's very simple. You just type in your state. So for example, if we type in California, you would, and then enter, you'll see all the different support groups in California. And if we can just click quickly on one of those, uh, in the drop down, just click on the first one there, Santa Cruz, California, Amira. And scroll down, and you could see all the information of who to all contact, right. the phone number, when the group meets, and then if there's a website. So that's how you find a support group, or you could always uh, email SG Team for support group team at myloma.org. And we're always happy to help you find a support group because in addition to these wonderful webinars, we never want you to be alone. You should have support in your local communities and the IMF is there to help you make that happen. The last resource we'll show are where can you find all of the IMF videos. So Amira, up on the top of the page where it says about us, news and events, and then IMF videos. Up a little higher, there we go. And then this is where I'll leave you to do a lot of homework. When you're, when you're finding you have nothing to do during COVID ID and if you're quarantined at home, you have lots of great videos here for resources. So check them all out. Like Dr. McHale had said, call the info line, 1-800-452-2873. We're all always here and happy to help you and support you on your journey. So thank you, everyone. Robin? Okay. One, one more thing yes, I'd just like you. to let people know um, that they can, um, for those support group leaders, I would really recommend if they want to show this presentation um, at one of their support group meetings, um, we're happy to provide Yeah, they, they'll have it for that, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Okay, well, thank you, Robin, and thanks to everyone. We appreciate it, and thanks to our technical staff, Amira and Miko, and for everyone to move us into this new technical era. We're especially pleased that we're able to ask questions, and so now we know it works. We'll be expanding on that as well, so we understand your concerns and, and, and the like and can move forward together. So thanks to everyone. Stay safe. Thank you, everyone. Don't thank forget, you can ask Dr. Dury. Uh-oh. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye.